Hey, what's going on, Grid family? So glad you are with us today on the link. Hey, grab your Bible, open to the book of 1 John, chapter number 3. We're going to be looking at verses 18, or excuse me, verses 11 to 18. Today's title is Prove You Love Me. I almost entitled this, Get Down on Your Knees and Tell Me You Love Me. <laughs> Name that movie. Anybody? Anybody out there? Home Alone. Home Alone 2, to be exact. Home Alone 2. In the hotel room. Prove you love Prove you love me. Listen, I love my kids. My kids are awesome. We do this thing where we do one-on-one -on -one time with Dad. If it's, if it's me and one of my boys, it's man time. If it's me and one of my girls, it's daddy-daughter date time. I love all of my kids. They all, I love them equally, but I love them differently as well. Like if I'm hanging with Johnny, he's got to have dedicated one-on-one -on -one time conversation. We could be throwing the ball. We could be sitting down at McDonald's, but he's got to have conversation, dedicated time. If I'm hanging with Jack, it's got to be something like entertainment, right? Like it's got to be sports or action or entertainment to keep his attention. If it's my baby girl, Jerrica, it's all cuddles, cuddles all day long, quality cuddling time. But with my baby girl, Jovi, it's a totally different story. It doesn't mean we don't have to have conversation. We don't have to look each other in the eye. We don't need to touch. All she needs is shopping. Shopping, shopping, shopping. Just stuff, stuff, stuff. Like I got to mentally prepare when her and I go on our daddy daughter dates. Because like we'll go to the mall. We'll go to a thrift shop. We'll go to a store. And, and like mistake number one is I'm, all right, baby girl, you can pick out five things. Well, five things means that each of the five things are going to take like 45 minutes to pick out, right? Because you got to go. You got to pick it out. You got to get my approval. You got to go try it on. You got to come out of the fitting room. Daddy's going to look pretty. Daddy has this look on me. Daddy the earring, daddy the necklace, daddy the shoes, daddy how's this one? Okay, good. You like this one? Cool. That's number one. And that's like 45 minutes, but then we got five more. So it's like a three hour process just to do it. But here's the thing. This is how my baby girl, Jovi, feels love right now in her life. Now imagine if I told her, Jovi, I love you. I'd do anything for you. I love you so, so, so much but I never bought her anything or, or did anything in the way that she perceives love right now. And again, I know it may change, but right now, the way she perceives love is through stuff. Now again, I, it, we can have the debate on if that's healthy or not healthy, but regardless of that, this is how she's perceiving love right now. Imagine if I, I love you so much, but I never did anything for her in the way that she perceives love. She wouldn't believe me, right? Like she would, we just bought her a bike for an example. We got our brand new bike and the tires went flat. She's like, Dad, can you wear up my tires? Like, sure, absolutely. Well, my pump broke. And I told her, baby girl, I'm going to go get a pump tomorrow. We'll fill up your tires. It's going to be awesome. Well, the next day was insane. I totally forgot all about it, right? And I cannot, and now you know where this is going all of a sudden, right? Like I forgot to get the pump. And I come home. She's like, Daddy, can we air up my bike? I'm like, oh, baby girl, I'm so sorry. I forgot to get the pump today. And all of a sudden, bursting into the daddy you promised me daddy i'm not kidding it went on for 30 minutes right like just this is how she perceives love or for an example, like my, my lovely bride, whose birthday is on Tuesday, she's getting well up there in years. 33, she's gonna be, I'm just kidding, she's not, no, I'm just, but it is her birthday, she'll be 33 on Tuesday. Now imagine if I told my love, who's who, who my wife, whose number one way that she experiences love is through words, words and quality time. Imagine if I told her, babe, I love you, but I never wrote it down. I never said, babe, I love you. Oh, your eyes are so beautiful and your hair, oh my gosh, is so amazing. And your neck, like the Tower of David. Some of you never read Song of Solomon. Now, I'm going to stop right there to keep it PG for us today. But imagine if I told her I love you, but I never wrote it down or I never went to great lengths to communicate why I love my wife. She wouldn't believe me. 
The point is this, is that love has action to back it up. Love has to be proved. Love, in the words of DC Talk, love is a verb. Love has action to it. Now, let me just bring some structure to the verses that we're going to read. Because this verse, these verses pass is all about love. It's all about, not just, not like, the, not romantic love, but this is the kind of love that we would have for each other. Phileo type love. Brotherly type love. This is what this entire passage is all about. So let me bring some structure to these verses as we start reading here i've got three big ideas not me i believe john has three big ideas for us today the first idea is this love has a start love has a start and if you are in a relationship or you were in love today you probably remember the moment that love started for you for me the tender age of eight years of old, eight years old i remember tressa whitmore walked into my church Dirty blonde hair, 1993 bangs. She had it going on for an eight-year-old. And I remember having that feeling like, oh, I've never felt this before. And later on in life, I start dating my wife. Now we start dating, right? And like, we're a couple years. And we dated for a long time. Like six years, we dated. And um, I remember like, I don't remember how long into it, but I remember a fairly lengthy time into our relationship, two, three years. Britannica starts asking me the question, Britannica starts asking me that question, David, do you love me? And I remember the first time she asked me, we were on the phone and I froze. I was like, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, and that's all I could say. I was like, I, I really like you. I like you a lot, <laughs> but I didn't, I didn't know what love was. I didn't know if I was experiencing love. I had no idea, but love has, a, so I can tell you this, that I do love my wife with everything inside of me. I don't remember exactly when it started, but I do remember it had a start, right? Love has a start. Let's look at it here in verse number 11. John says, for this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. What message? That we should love one another. The only reason you love and you experience love is because Jesus first loved you. Man, I want to be one of those weird people, right? That just love people unconditionally. I want to be one of those weird people. Be like, what is this guy? Why is he all up in my bed? Why does he care about me? I want to be one of those weird people because Jesus says this in the book of John. By this, you should, all men should know that you love me. But by the way that you love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If you love one another. Love, love, love. Love has a start. Love has a beginning. Love is the, is the identifying factor of every believer in the Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, can I just tell you this? You can't be grumpy and be a Christian at the same time. You cannot be grumpy. You can't be a grumpy cry. I'm just a grump. I just had a rough life. I just have a reason to be. No, no, no. That's not what my Bible says. That's not what scripture says by this, by this love. All men will know that you are my disciples. But if you walk around like grumpy, right? All the time. No one's going to know that you're a Christian. No one's going to know you by your love. You shall be known by your love. But if you're constantly a sourpuss and you're constantly grumpy and you're constantly not showing love, you are not, people are not going to know that you are. I don't even go as far as to say that perhaps you're not a disciple. If that's the if that's the countenance of your life, the depression of your life, I'm talking about clinical depression, but the countenance of your life is depressed then I would venture to say that you don't have the joy of the Lord in your life. I, I, I understand you, you could have a bad day. You could have a bad moment. You could have had a bad year, right? Like we could all experience that. But if the countenance of your life is depressed then you have reason to stand back and say, is, is Jesus the joy of my heart? Do I have the joy of the Lord? The jo is the joy of the Lord my strength? Is the, is the countenance of my life happy and joy filled or is it grumpy? And if people can't or won't know that you are a Christian based upon the joy in your life, then it's time you had a serious conversation with yourself. Am I a believer? Do I have the joy of the Lord in my life? I want us to notice that word in verse number 11, the word heard, for this is the message that you heard from the beginning. This is powerful. This is the reason that we declare the word of God publicly and we declare it audibly in every known language, in every tongue, in sign language, in every way possible. We declare the word of God because it means that people can understand because the moment you declare it, you are now held accountable for it. This is why we preach the word of God audibly in sign language, digitally, in every way possible because the moment you declare it, 
it, you are now held accountable for it. And the moment you hear it, you have the choice. I'm either going to affirm it or I'm going to deny it. And if what you heard, you affirm, you are now held accountable for that. Dad, you promised me you're going to buy. I, I told my baby, I'm going to buy you a bike, pump, pump up your tires. Now I spoke it audibly. Now my daughter heard it audibly. Now I'm held accountable for what I spoke. And my daughter is also held accountable for what she heard. And she's keeping me held accountable. You can tell what I'm dealing with in my life. This is why it's so powerful that we declare the word of God, that we declare what we believe. Not only do we declare what we believe, we declare what we heard and what we are believing in our heart because now we are held accountable for it. What did they hear from the beginning? What did we hear from the beginning that we must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. This is what you heard from the beginning. We declare it out loud that we are known by our love, that we have to love. We cannot be called Christians and hate our fellow brother. We cannot be called Christians and hate the world or hate people. We can't do that. The only reason you were, if you're saved today, watching online, the only reason you're saved is because Jesus loved, reached deep into the depths of your heart to change your life. That is the only reason you're a believer. It's known, we, we are known by the love of God. We are known by the love of God in our life because while we were sinners, while we were wretched, while we betrayed Jesus, while we were enemies of Christ, he died for us in that moment. And he died for us based upon his love for us. Therefore, we must be known by that same kind of love. Listen, you can't love Jesus and hate people. <laughs> yeah, it's not, it, it, it doesn't work that way. You can't claim to be a Christian, claim to be a Christ follower, claim to love Jesus, and yet hate people. Have you ever met those people? Man, ministry would be so awesome if I just didn't have to deal with people. <laughs> I just hate people. If I didn't have to deal with people, then I'd be having them. The, 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 you are not a Christian. Then can I just tell you that point blank? If you hate people, there's no way you're a Christian because you have to be marked by the love of God in your life. This is why. This is how people know you're a disciple and how people know you're a Christian. It's by your love. Do you love people that way? Do you love people actively? Do you love people in your heart? Do you look at people and do you love them? Do you? Does your heart? break for them when they are hurting? Does your heart break for them when they are in sin? Do you love people that way? Listen, if you struggle to love people or to see the good in people or to value them the way that Jesus values them, then it's time you had a conversation with yourself, with yourself to remind yourself how wretched of a person you actually are as well. And while you were so wretched and so sinful, that's when Christ died for you. While you were an enemy of Christ, that's when he died for you. Just to be clear, what John is saying here is that we have to love our fellow brother, our fellow Christian, some of the most difficult and challenging people to love on the planet are fellow believers. That's what John is referring to. But that, let me just make this clear, that does not negate our calling to also love non-believers, people that are of the world, people that are in the, that does not negate our calling. We must love our fellow brother. We must look across this room and look across those in our church and we have to say, I love you. I love you. I'll do anything. I'll lay down my life for you. I'll do that. But that doesn't negate our call to love our non-believing brothers and sisters sisters as well. This is what John is getting at today. That brings us to John's second big idea, and it's this. Love has a nature. Love has a nature. Let's look at it in verse number 12. John says, we should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one. Just notice that phrase, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's were righteous, just so that we're all on the same page. We're not going to take time to look at it, but you can find that story in Genesis chapter 14. Let me just recap it briefly for you. Cain and Abel both brought sacrifice and offerings to the Lord. Cain's sacrifice was not pleasing to the Lord. Abel's was. Why? Because Abel gave of the first fruit of his flock. He gave the firstborn of his flock, which would be the most valuable, which would have cost him the most. And Abel said, God, I'm going to bring you the very best. I'm going to bring you the first 
firstborn of my entire flock. I'm going to offer it to you because now this cost Abel something. Cain looked at his brother and Cain, what did Cain do? Cain just brought to him some, some flippant fruit and, and vegetables of the field. It didn't cost him anything at all. And God looked upon Abel's sacrifice and it was pleasing and it was acceptable to him. However, God looked upon Cain's sacrifice, Cain's offering, and it didn't cost him anything. It, it required no faith whatsoever. And God rejected his offering. This caused Cain to be filled with jealousy towards Abel. And the Bible says that Cain killed his brother Abel. And just so that we're clear, it wasn't just like a, bl a bludgeon to the head. No, no, no. He slit his throat. He butchered his brother. He slaughtered his brother because he was so filled with hate, because he was so filled with jealousy, because he was of the evil one. Love has a nature. It doesn't tell us the motive. It tells us simply that love, the, the nature of Cain was of the evil one. What's the point? It can be found in this phrase in verse 12. Cain was of the evil one. That phrase doesn't give us Cain's motive, but it gives us the nature of who he was. Listen, if you have no love, if you don't have a heart of compassion for your fellow mankind, if your heart is not moved into action, then John is saying, perhaps you were of the evil one, just like Cain. If your outward hatred or your inward lethargy and passivity towards um, loving and taking action are the same as murdering them, it's no different whatsoever. This is, this is uh, John's point today. This passage really serves a couple different purposes. Then number one, to show us that our love, a believer's love, is what sets us apart from the world. However, what sets the world apart from the believer is their hatred and their hatred that turns into murder, maybe not physical murder, but spiritual murder by hate. Now, as we move into verse 13, John almost kind of flips the script. He's not, he's not only telling us to love unconditionally, to love the way Jesus loves, but he's also telling us that it's going to be normal and natural for the world to hate us. Although we may portray love, although we may show love unconditionally, although we may, we may be joy-filled and we may have great intentions to love people, and that doesn't mean that they're going to love us back, especially if they are of the world. That's why John says, in verse 13, don't be surprised. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. You almost have to pause right there and celebrate, right? Because the moment that you are known by your love and you are hated by the world, that is a that is an indicator right there. How do you know that you're in right relationship with God? How do you know that your life is saved? How do you know that you're going to spend an eternity in heaven in the unrestricted presence and access of God? If the world hates you, you have to stop and you have to pause. You can't be searching out and, and, and running after um, acclaim and, and fame with the world and friendship with the world because if you are friends with the world you are an enemy of God John says that himself you have to pause and you have to see this verse as a celebration don't be surprised that the world actually hates you praise God if the world hates me if the world hates me that means that I'm in right standing with God that means that God is smiling upon me that means that the joy of the Lord is filling my heart that means that my life is so filled with love people see that love and they hate that kind of a love and they hate me for it that means I am in right standing with God Almighty so you have to ask yourself the question, are you experiencing the world's hate? Have you ever experienced the world's hate? And if your answer is no, then you got to ask yourself the question, well, why not? Why am I not experiencing that kind of hate? Let's go on. Verse number 14, John says, we know, just underline that word, we know, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. I just want us to highlight that word, we know. We know, we know, we know, we know. Listen, when I know something, it changes everything about me. It changes the way I talk and the way I walk. It changes the way I communicate with people because if I know that I know that I know something, I'm going to let you know that I know it. I'm going to prove people wrong until they know that I know what I know, until I know that they know what I know, until I know that they know that they know. I'm telling you, my mom called it stubborn growing up. My wife calls it prideful now. I just say, I just know. I know, I know. I'm not afraid of a debate when I know that I know that I know that I know something, I'm going to debate until I'm blue in the face, until I've convinced that person and they bow down to my superior knowledge and expertise on the issue. I know that I know. What's John's point? We know. We know. 
We know that we know that we know that we have passed out of death and we are passed into life. We are not of the world. We are of heaven. We are of another world. When our lives end, we are of another world. We are aliens on this planet. We know that we know that we know if we are experiencing the world's hate, then we know. We know that we know that we are in right standing with God. The problem is we've got too many weak-willed Christians walking around with no purpose, with no direction, with hate in their heart, with lethargy and passivity in their heart, not loving the brothers, not loving the world, not loving anybody. We've got too many weak-willed Christians walking around just hoping that they're going to do enough to get them into the pearly gates. Is that the goal? Is that your end goal just to make it to heaven? That's not my goal. My goal, I want to be in heaven, absolutely, but my goal is not just to make it there. My goal is to experience, in the, to experience the full extent of God's reward for me in heaven. He's, he's marking it down everything I've spoken, everything I've done that no one's ever known about, that no one's ever seen. God's writing it down because he wants to, me to experience the full extent of my reward. And the problem problem is too many weak-willed weak Christians walking around with no love, not loving the brothers, not loving the fellow Christians, not loving the world. How will people know that we are Christians and that we are of God and that we are of another world by our love? This is how you know you've passed out of death and into life is that you are so filled with love. You look at people and you love them. You look at their situation and you love them. You don't judge people based upon their situation or circumstance. You love them as they are the way Jesus does. And you allow Jesus to come in and work in their heart. This is how you are known by the world. That you are of, the, of another world. That you are of God. It's by your love. This isn't a hard test at all. Do you love people? Awesome. Then you're of God. Do you not love people? Are you passive? Are you lethargic towards them? Then, then perhaps you are not of God. Perhaps you are not of God the way John is talking about today. What's the point here? It's found in that phrase in, in this verse, whoever does not love abides in death. Listen, if love is not the identifying mark of your life, then perhaps you abide in death. You're no different than Cain was when he murdered his brother Abel. It's no different. But just, I don't know any other way to read and to interpret this passage. And I have to ask myself, and we all have to ask ourselves the question, God, do I love the way you love? Is my heart filled with love or am I filled with hate, whether outward or whether inward? Listen, indifference, passivity, and lethargy towards people, towards brothers, towards non-believers, it's no different than hate. It's simply hate. That's all it is. Listen, you can't expect the, those who are of the evil one to act any differently than the evil one. Their job and their role is to hate and to murder. Maybe not physically, but spiritually, right? You can't expect that. But that does not negate the brother's calling, the believer's calling to love unconditionally, to continue showing love to the brothers and to the non and to the non-believers. That's our that's our job to love unconditionally. John further emphasizes this point in verse 15. He says this, Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. I don't want us to skip the shocking reality of what John just said. You may claim Christianity. You may convince people of your Christianity. You may be convince people that you're a Christian because you go to church and because you give and because you serve on whatever team. You may convince people of your Christianity. But if there is hatred in your heart, if there is indifference in your heart, if there is passivity in your heart and there is no love in your heart, you are not of God. You are of the evil one. You are filled with hate. You are. You, you must be marked by the love of God. If the love of God is in your life, then your then your life will surely show it. Because love has action. Love has. Love is a verb. Love has to be displayed. It has to be shown. And the only way it's going to happen. The only way people will know of your love is if you show your love. You're marked by God's love. But if in your heart is hatred. If in your heart is indifference, then perhaps you got to take a step back and say, God, is, is your love even in my heart? Am I marked by your love? And if your answer is no, then great news. There is grace for you today. There's grace for you today to experience the love of God and to go and to show the love of God to this world. This brings us to John's third and his final big idea, and, and it's this, love has action. Love has action, verse 16. By this we know, love, that he laid down his life for us. This is referring to Jesus, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Romans chapter 5, Paul says this, while we were still sinners, enemies of Christ, that's when he died for us. 
No greater love has ever been displayed than the moment Jesus died for the sins of all mankind. Not when we got cleaned up, not when we felt that we were righteous enough. No, while we were sinners, while we were wretched, while we were filthy, while we were naked, while we were filled with shame, that's when Jesus died for us. Jesus is our ultimate example of the greatest love ever displayed on the earth. Let me just give you three things really quick. Number one, you don't have to get cleaned up to come to God. God doesn't require you to take a shower and clean up all of your mess before you come to him. God says, come to me and I will clean up your mess. I will make sure that I speak with you. I will make sure that you are in right standing with me, but come to me just as you are, just as you are. Come to me. Don't get cleaned up first. I'll take care of all that. Number two, Christians, don't you dare cast judgment on those who come to God just as they are. Don't, with your preconceived ideas and preconceived notions, begin to, to begin to put that on the people. No, allow people to come to God just as they are, and you simply love them. Don't judge them because their lifestyle isn't quite lining up with maybe what the Word of God says. They, they may not know, but allow God, allow the Spirit to convict them, allow them to experience love, allow them to experience church life, allow them to get into community with people, allow them to be just as they are before you start casting judgment on them. But not at all. Don't cast judgment on them. Allow them just to be and allow Jesus to do the work. Number three, are you willing to lay down your life the way Jesus laid down his life for us? Are you willing? Do you have that kind of mentality? Is that your default mode? Is that my default mode that I'd lay down my life for a brother, that I'd lay down my life for a non-believer? I think we all think we want to we, we want to have that kind of courage, right? The gunman walks into the bank and you jump in front of the elderly lady on the walker, right? You think like we all want to have that kind of courage, but is that our default mode? Am I so filled with love? And what John is saying is that if you were so filled with love, then your default mode in those situations would be to lay down your life for the brother, for the non-believer. And if you're so filled with love in moments where you have the choice, not just a knee-jerk reaction, not just a default mode, but in those moments where you have a choice to lay down your life, you have there, there is no option. There is no choice. You're going to lay down your life. Do you have that kind of love operating in your life? This is sobering. This is shocking. This has caused all of us to get down on our knees and say, God, am I filled with that kind of love so much that I would lay down my life the way you laid down your life for me, the way you died a brutal murder for me, am I willing to do the exact same thing for a brother or for a non-believer? This is, this is a shocking reality for a lot of people to recognize. Maybe I'm not filled with the kind of love that I thought I was. Let's keep reading here. Verse 17, John says, but if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him. I remember before we ever started the Grid Church, before we ever started this church, it was in Britannica and I's heart to, to reach the homeless population um, here in Chicago. We have a burden for the homeless. And, and if you're part of our church, you know that we are out on the street every single week, every Sunday, every other Monday night. We are out on our street. This isn't just something we say. This is something we actually do. And I remember before we ever started, we didn't really know how to go about doing street ministry. We didn't, we didn't, I mean, we had experience doing it, but we didn't have a lot of experience doing it. And I remember having conversations with people in our church before we ever started. I was like, hey, what do you think about, you know, doing homeless ministry? And, and it was, a, there was an excitement around it. We didn't know what to do. So about a year in, we just did what we knew to do. We started a coat drive, we started a food drive, and we we're just going to collect items, and then we're just going to take them out to the street. Now, there, that's that's awesome. That is wonderful. That is noble. That is that is a righteous thing to do. But there is some logistics and some things that you need to go into uh, street ministry with. And I and I remember we just started in the very first week that we started our our coat driving and you may have been there you may remember that that, uh, that day that sunday morning in the donk house when we started collecting coats and warm winter items and and non-perishable foods and all these different things right you may have been there that day i remember on that day we had a get we had a guest family that day they walked in very first time to our church and they were they were coming from another church where they had been part of street ministry for 15 20 years and many of you know them now, Aaron and Sada'i and Addison Gar is a part of our church. They lead worship with us, for us. Um, Aaron leads up our I Love My City street ministry every single week. And I remember they walked in and this was the moment where our church took off with our, with our outreach, with our homeless outreach. And because the reality is this, God's heart breaks for the homeless people in our city. How dare we walk by those people and cast judgment on them? Oh, they're not really homeless. They're just panhandling. They're probably making more money than I am. How dare we cast judgment on 
on that person. What Jesus says is what you do unto the least of these, you do unto me. The reality is this. We are out on the street every single Sunday, every single Monday night. We know where they live. We know their names. We know their stories. They know our names. They know our stories. Some of them know where we live because we've had them into our home. This is the reality of what John is saying. If you have the world's goods, if you have the world's goods and you see your brother who is in need, yet you close your heart against them, how does the love of God abide in you whatsoever? If you're walking down the street, if you're if you're driving down Lakeshore Drive and you get off on, on Wilson or on Lawrence or on Foster and you see people in the underpass living in tents and you do nothing about it, does the love of God really abide in you? If you're walking down Michigan Avenue and you see that homeless mom with their kids does the and you do nothing about it, does the love of God abide in you? Are you casting judgment on the man? They, they're probably not even really homeless. If you go through Lower Wacker, and you see the and you see the guys living on the street and you do nothing about it does the love of god actually abide in you this is what John is saying. This is this is a hard reality for us to grasp. This is a hard because we want we want to say, yeah, we're filled with the love of God. We take care of our family. We make sure our needs are met. That's awesome, and you need to do that. That's biblical, as right that you take care of your needs, you take care of your family, you take care of your kids. But but God is also saying this: if you see your brother in need, who is in need, living on the street, they have no food, they have no shelter, they need a coat, they need some, they need underwear, they need something. If you see your brother in need and you do nothing about it, is the love of God actually really abiding in you whatsoever? And the, uh, the insinuated answer is no, it's not. The love of God does not abide in you. This is love has action. Love has, love has, uh, it's action. It's action based. Jesus laid down his life for, there was an action to back up his love for us. And John is saying that not only are you going to lay down your life, but you, if you see your brother in need, you're going to do something about it. You may not have cash on you. You may not have anything in that moment, but maybe you could go buy them a burger. Maybe you could go get them a gift card to McDonald's. Maybe you could go do, buy them a pair of underwear, right? You could do something about it. And so today I leave us with this encouragement in verse number 18. John says, little children, let us not love in word or in talk, but in deed and in truth. Basically meaning this, don't just say that you love. Now I love my brothers and I love the non-believer and I love the people living on the street. Now if, if you really love them, then John is saying this, then it ought to show in your life. It ought to show by the things that you do for them, by the things that you do in them, by the things that you do for them in deed and in truth, in actuality. This is what John is saying. Love is not a word. Love is not an idea. It's not an ideal. It is not a feeling. Love has action to back it up. Prove your love to fellow believers Prove your love to those who aren't believers. Prove your love. Go out of your way to show this love. Jesus did, and so should we. Amen? Let's pray together today. Father, I love you. I thank you for your word. It's alive, it's living, it's active. And I pray you would challenge us today by the power of your word to love the way you love. God, may it not be an idea. May it not be a feeling, God. May it not be just filled with warm, fuzzy goosebumps. But I pray that our lives would be marked by love so much that we are moved to action, I pray. You know, maybe you're watching today online and you say, Pastor, my reality is this. At one time in my life, I would say that I was walking with Jesus. I experienced his love and I was walking with, I, I was involved in church and involved in my relationship with God. But life has gotten such that I'm not walking with Jesus anymore. Maybe for you, there's never been a moment when you've made Jesus the Lord and the Savior of your life. I want to give you an opportunity to experience God's love today in a unique and a supernatural way way today. I'm going to pray a prayer and I'd invite you to pray this prayer with me. Listen, words don't change anything, but the Bible says in the book of Romans that if you if you pray this prayer, you confess it with your mouth, you believe it in your heart, then you are a child of the living God. So all together, would you say, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I need you in my life. I ask you into my heart, forgive me of all of my sins and free me and fill me with your spirit. I am chosen, and I'm a child of God, now and forever. 
Amen and amen. Hallelujah. We give God all the praise for everything he's doing in your life. I pray that now your life would be marked by love, not just love that you speak of, but love that is actually backed up by action. I pray you get involved. I, I'm so grateful, so thankful, so thrilled for you that you made that decision. We've got some info down below for you to text in. Maybe you prayed that prayer and you're like, oh, that's awesome. I, I feel great now, but what do I do now? Well, text in what now to 75787. We'll have our team reach out to you, connect with people, answer any questions you may have, put a Bible in your hand if you need one, or help you download a Bible app, whatever you need. We want to be there, walk the journey with you. An awesome way you can get involved, number one way, is through our I Love My City outreach. You can text in that number, uh, 75787, text in I Love My City to that number, and that'll shoot us an alert, and we'll have Aaron Garza, the leader of our street ministry, reach out to you and get you plugged in. It will bless you, it will bless your family, and you'll make a difference. You'll You'll be able to show tangible love to the people of Chicago, to our homeless brothers and our homeless sisters. You bring them, bring them food, bring them underwear, bring them socks, bring them warm winter items, bring them whatever, but also bring the love of Jesus. Be a powerful way. And if you're checking this out for the first time, thank you for taking time out of your weekend to come and worship with us. Hope you were encouraged and inspired in your walk with Jesus. Got some info down below just to connect with you and to hear your story, share a little bit of our story, and reach this city one neighborhood at a time. So get plugged in, get connected. Also want to say thank you to everyone who came out yesterday to our Party in the Park event at Wells Park. Thanks for setting up. Thanks for loving people. Thanks for putting on a great event. So grateful for you. So grateful for the city. Believe God's on the move. After taking the last year off from any event in the park, we're bringing them back, and we're excited to do that. Uh, one of the ways we're able to do that is through your generosity and through your giving. So thank you. Thank you for being a generous church. All the info is down below for you to keep on being faithful in your tithing and in your offering and in your missions giving. Your dollars don't just impact our community. They go across the world to make a difference, not only here, but across the globe to help plant churches, to help reach children, to help reach uh, people in Indonesia, all across the world. So thank you for giving. Thanks for your generosity. We love you, church. We're praying for you. If you ever need anything at all, don't hesitate to reach out to DM, to shoot us a text shoot us an email, call us, whatever you need. We love you. We're praying for you. We'll see you back here on the link, or we'll see you live and in person next Sunday morning at 11 a.m. Have a great week. Great church.